All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Everything College World Podcast. Today, me and Nick will be breaking down the Wisconsin Badgers and why they are one of the biggest winners of this offseason and why they're quietly going to become a big-time contender, I think, long-term here in college football. Uh, first game things started, though, Nick. You know, Paul Chris was fired on October 2nd, 67-26 record. He won the West three times, 6-1 and one bowl record during his tenure. He had uh, double-digit winning seasons four times. This is a guy that was very successful at Wisconsin. He took his job incredibly serious in this postseason mark. I think certainly showcases that. Um, but, you know, the writing was on the wall, Nick. You know, he went two and three, was fired after five games, went nine and four in 2021. We debated this a couple of months ago. Was it too soon? Uh, you know, was he undeservingly fired? And, you know, the reason why he wasn't fired, it's not confusing one bit. You know, this is something we talked about heading into the season with Wisconsin. Is that this team certainly has the talent to compete uh, at a national level, but they won't because of the lack of creativity on offense. They're incredibly one-dimensional. Same thing year after year. And we said the same thing about Iowa, too. You know, this is a team, uh, you know, at middle of the pack quarterback play, very average, below average quarterback play. I guess you could say Grant Mertz was a highly touted four-star coming out of high school in his first career game. He was a star, but he, you know, has not uh, looked like that one bit since, you know, the couple years since that happened against uh, the fighting Illini. So, you know, Wisconsin, again, though, Nick, incredibly one-dimensional. No creativity to their offense. They've always had great running backs, great numbers on the ground. Uh, Braylon Allen's next up, and he opted to stay with this new coaching tenure, which we'll address here momentarily. Um, but th- there's no confusion here, Nick. You know, the defense is obviously tremendously elite year after year, um, but the only times they ever seem to get burned were against Ohio State, where their offense could not keep up and do them any favors. Uh, and, you know, it just it, it was a never-ending cycle, it seemed. You know, they would uh, compete, they'd play hard, win these low-scoring games. They'd win a lot of football games because the playing style would certainly – uh, you know, the coaching style as well certainly outpaces opponents. And I think that's why they had a success that was sustainable for a little bit. But, you know, this new era of college football, it certainly was not going to last. You need defense, but no offense to back it up whatsoever. And again, those games against the Buckeyes uh, showcased everything. Because every time they played them, they had no answer for them other than probably in 2017. Where this team went 13-1, and won, won the Orange Bowl. Uh, they lost to the Buckeyes by a couple of points where they would have made the college football playoff if they won that game. That was about it, though. You know, Nick, that's how I kind of summarize uh, Paul Christ's tenure, a winning coach. But um, do you think he was unfairly fired considering he did win nine games back in 2021? The folks in Madison were clearly tired of the same old, same old. And it certainly wasn't bad. You know, most programs in college football would kill to have, you know, a consistent 10-win season coach. When you're a program like Wisconsin, you want to compete for national championships. And when you have a one-dimensional offense, like you said, that you know, they ground and pound. That's all they can do, right? They can't throw the ball really at all. And it finds them in trouble when they get behind against big opponents. Paul Chris, you know, 67-26 overall record. I was pretty impressed with him overall in his tenure at Wisconsin. I thought it was, you know, a consistently solid program. Cared about postseason play, especially you know, six and one in bowl games, with the one loss coming in the Rose Bowl by one point to Oregon. as a really good Oregon team that just missed out in the College Bowl playoff that year. So I think, you know, top to bottom, his tenure in Wisconsin was successful, right? You know, built a consistent contender. But I think the folks in Madison they want to be able to compete for Big Ten titles every single year. They want to be playing in the New Year's Six Bowl every in a New Year's Six Bowl every single year, and they want to go to the playoffs ultimately. And a scheme change, you know, and a new young youngish coach that has a good kind of experience coaching offenses as well as coaching defenses and kind of build up a more high flying, high style, high pace offense is really what they're going to need to compete with teams like Michigan, Ohio State, Michigan State, who are certainly going to look to bounce back at this point in time. It's a bit harsh to fire a coach that's you know 67 to 26 overall. I think it's you know you know plus 40 wins to loss ratio. You know right, that's a pretty substantial number in college football. But I think he was just continue to hold them back, and it would have been like Iowa, where Iowa they've stuck with their coach for so long, and they're really kind of just handcuffed. And they're stuck where they are, and Iowa's really not going to ever develop and change into a competitive program until they fire their head coach or let their head coach retire and bring in someone that's young and going to bring change change on the offense. I do think one thing that's underrated is Joe Rudolph. This guy was there from 2015 to 2021 as the offensive line coach. Uh, he was a big help in the run game. And, you know, he's the run game coordinator now at Virginia Tech. He left his alma mater of Wisconsin to go to Virginia Tech. That's certainly not a great look. You know, I think he kind of understood maybe things were getting a little soft and sour there. And maybe he already knew the writing was on the wall. So I think Joe Rudolph departing was kind of uh, uh, the first step towards the end of the time for Paul Christ. And moving to the guy that replaced him, though, you know, Nick, this kind of came out of nowhere. I thought Luke Fickle was going to stay with Cincinnati, especially since they moved that moved to the Big 12, where they could certainly attract a little bit more talent on the recruiting side, while they could also certainly continue to compete for college football playoff appearances, because he led Cincinnati to the CFP in the group of five. First time ever 
for that uh, you know side of college football. And I felt like you know this is a guy that's coached in the state of Ohio his entire life. I figured he was content with Cincinnati late in November. Wisconsin shocks us all by bringing Fickle in. Very stunned to see this news, Nick. You know, Jim Leonard would have been the head coach if Fickle did not get hired. Chris McIntosh, still the athletic director, made a big splash here. You know, what was your initial reaction to Fickle landing this job? Because it really did seem to come out of nowhere. But I think, uh, you know, considering uh, the fallout, you know, in a positive way for Wisconsin since they've added Fickle has been phenomenal. I think this is exactly what they had in mind. This is an A-plus hire. And I think things could really work out long term. We'll talk about it why here in a second. But, uh, you know, overall, what is your reaction to Fickle leaving Cincinnati considering the points I just made about why he should have potentially stayed there. This is certainly one of the splashiest hires we've seen in college football in the last five years or so. You know, I was in the same boat as you. I figured he would rock it with Cincinnati for a while until that Ohio State job potentially opened up. You know, they're making the transition out of the American Conference to a bigger conference to play a more tough schedule this coming season in the Big 12. So I think I thought he was going to kind of ride with that and ride the transition point. Cincinnati, he had taken them to a point where they, as high as they can go, right? You know, 11-3 in 2019, 11-2 in 2018, 9-1 in 2020, 13-1 in 2021, making the playoff and losing to Alabama, playing Alabama very close. People forget that was a close game for a while. He also has experience. You know, he was the interim coach at Ohio State following the Jim Trestle, you know, sort of fallout and scandal that occurred there with the tattoos and improper benefits in 2011. Then he was the, offense, the defensive coordinator for the next five years for taking the Cincinnati job. He obviously wants the Ohio State job, alma mater. I mean, who wouldn't want to coach their alma mater? I certainly think that's a very attractive offer for any college football coach. You want to coach where you where you played, honestly, or where you just went to school. So I thought this was a bit shocking to jump to a, you know, to a program that is a rival to a degree in the Big Ten. But I think this sets him up to a good position. If you can keep big, uh, Wisconsin competitive in the Big Ten, and if Ryan Day, you know, the situation of Ryan Day sours in Ohio State, I could certainly see Ohio State making the call to Madison and trying to grab him at some point in the next you know two to three years at this point. This is a good move for Fickle. This is a great move for Wisconsin. A high-energy guy going to be there on the sidelines. Good recruiter, building good teams, can win without talent. Obviously, you know, Cincinnati is not the most talented program in the country, and he was able to get them to the playoff. So like, he can win without talent, you know, under 50 years old. This is a great hire for me, a home run hire. I think Wisconsin is going to make some good work in the portal. We've already seen some of that with some of the transfers they brought in. I think they would be great on the recruiting trail, and he's going to be able to get the best out of the guys, despite, you know, maybe their talent being less than some of the other big, header, big hitters in the Big Ten. Now, again, Wisconsin's biggest problem, you know, the biggest flaw they had was stale offense. Then they bring in Phil Longo. He's the offensive coordinator now. He comes over from North Carolina, had great success with Drake May, Sam Howell. Uh, this was a guy that really helped Mac Brown win a lot of football games over there at Chapel Hill. And this is a guy that's going to bring an air raid style offense, an RPO uh, style offense as well. Uh, and he brings in Tanner Mordecai from SMU, a very productive quarterback. He started at Oklahoma, was very successful with the Mustangs. He's been around some very good coaches, Sonny Dykes being one of them. Uh, you know, this is a guy that's very good, Nick. This is a guy that's uh, certainly probably going to skyrocket up some draft boards this past or this upcoming season. Very good player, a lot of arm talent, very productive, and he's going to fit the scheme very well. He certainly has the athletic traits to certainly fit what he's looking for. Because Longo's offense requires the quarterback to, you know, be heavily involved on the ground, and I think that's the biggest reason why people are kind of uh, underrating or maybe potentially overlooking Wisconsin. They're not getting a lot of loves because they did not see who they brought in an offensive coordinator and that they have a great guy to run it. Joe Huber then from Cincinnati, along with Jake Renfro on the offensive line. That's just two big-time additions for a team that's always stout up front. They also bring in Bryson Green from Oklahoma State, and then C.J. Williams from USC, players that have coming, you know, they've come from similar, uh, you know, bright offensive minds and schemes that certainly utilize their skill set. I think this is certainly going to be a big change for Wisconsin because, you know, schematic changes are never a good idea. But Braylon Allen is certainly bought in, uh, you know, considering he was not, you know, a lot of people expected him to enter the transfer portal. He did not. And, you know, the scheme change certainly does not seem to bother him. It's going to be interesting to see how he's utilized because I certainly think they don't want to shy away from the running game by any means. This is still the Big Ten after all. But this is certainly going to be very interesting to see how they all gel together, Nick. Uh, you know, what are your expectations for this offense? Longo, Mordecai, and some of these guys on the offensive line and a wide receiver, considering this offense has been just abysmal the last couple of years. Yeah, I think Mordecai is a great pickup from SMU. Had a good season there. You know, a nice passer in the pocket, solid player top to bottom, good control of the offense. Pretty high-flying offense in the past at SMU. I think he's a good player to have in there. You know, I think bringing in 
Luongo as their offensive coordinator. We saw what he did with Drake May, you know, kind of bringing that true talent out of Drake May and turning him into a superstar overnight with a high-flying air raid kind of offense. You saw it week one with Drake May getting five touchdowns in the first game of the season. I think we're going to see a similar thing. Mordecai is going to go attack the air early on. They're going to go for the air very often and heavy, but they're also going to have that good balance on the run, right? You can't abandon the run of the Big Ten. It's still a physical, heavy-hitting conference. I think they're going to have to keep their eyes on that and good, get good balance there. Braylon Allen, of course, staying. So I think that's a good guy to have in your backfield. Experience back, good leader in the locker room. Going to be able to take a few hits in contact, get yards after contact. So I think they have a good balance there with Mordecai and Allen starting this season. The scheme change, it's going to be difficult, right? It's going to take time for adjustments. So I think the break here possible, possible, maybe, you know, the expectations for this upcoming season should be lowered a little bit. But I think in year two, this team should be high flying and ready to go. I think they're going to have a good opportunity here to kind of get comfortable with this new system and get used to it and kind of develop what will be a more fun offense and a new take on a Big Ten offense that has been stale for the last 10 years. Yeah, it's really hard to get an assessment on how good they'll be here in year one because this is still a tough conference, uh, you know, top to bottom. It's not going to be made easy for you by any means. Um, but looking at the defensive side of things, you know, Jim Leonard, unfortunately, did not stay. I thought him and Fickle together would have been, uh, you know, just phenomenal for this defense. It would have been the best coach defense in college football. Uh, some disagreements there, and they part ways. Mike Trestle, though, does come over from Cincinnati. That's probably a big reason why he wanted to implement his own scheme. But I'm convinced that's going to be the 3-3-5. You know, so not only do they change things up tremendously on offense with the air raid, but they're going to dial things up a little differently on defense as well. Uh, you know, a lot of people say this 3-3-5 might not be fit for the Big Ten, Nick, considering the physicality of these teams. They're very good at running the ball. Um, and certainly the this scheme does not allow for you to be the best when it comes to stopping the run. It certainly helps against the pass. And, you know, this Cincinnati, the way the Cincinnati defense was coached, Certainly, you know, you know, uh, you know, sets them up to be quite fair against a team like Ohio State. That's where they make their money through the air. So it's going to be interesting to see how this defense works. But the biggest reason why people are interested to see what Fickle can do is because Wisconsin is always known for having those three-star or lower-ranked recruits on defense, and they turn them into complete superstars. Not necessarily guys that project to the next level very well, but they're tough, disciplined football players that make plays. And as a unit, they are great. You know, they've been one of the top-ranked running defenses in college football the last couple of seasons. Uh, you know, they play very hard. There are a lot of disruptors, especially from those outside linebackers. That's going to be different, though. You're not going to see that from this style of defense now. So it's going to be an interesting change, Nick. And I think this defense is definitely going to take a step back because they're not going to have the guys they exactly want to run this scheme. You know, what is your expectations for this side of the ball, considering, like a lot of people have been saying, uh, you know, this might not be a good fit for the Big Ten, but Fickle seems convinced that it's going to dominate. I think Jim Leonard leaving is a big missed opportunity here for Wisconsin. I thought it was a good idea to keep him to stay. Of course, Mike Trestle comes in, you know, nephew of Jim Trestle, which is a very interesting kind of tie there. I kind of find that kind of funny. You know, I think the 3-3-5 th th is a tough kind of thing to adjust to the big time. I don't think it really works that great in a run-focused conference. I think some teams that are kind of heavy on carrying the ball, like Iowa, could potentially have a nice day against Wisconsin in a matchup like that. I think I think it will take some time to kind of hammer this out, but I think it's a good point. You know, Fickle, like I said, at Cincinnati had a habit of grabbing talent, of grabbing guys that weren't super talented, developing them into superstars and getting them to play at the next level. And, you know, look at a guy like Sauce Gardner, who was a top five draft pick in NFL draft. So it certainly can develop talent. I think that's a good opportunity to develop some guys at Wisconsin, a school that also has been known for developing talent in the past out of guys that really just didn't really seem to have that talent. Okay. To a system that's more comfortable. You know, I think 335 will start to work over time. I think the first year will be an adjustment again. I think, you know, got to pump the brakes here a little bit. I think the first year will be a bit of an adjustment. I think this team long term has the, one of the best features in college football. I think they've got a great setup here with the coaching staff, and they're going to be able to hit the portal hard and bring in some solid recruits as well. I think this defense is going to get better over time. It just might be a tough adjustment season one. And like you said, player development, I think that's one thing to certainly focus on on defense. Cincinnati had six players drafted on defense this past year. Sauce Gardner leading the way. I mean, some very good football players that have made impacts here in year one. Uh, and, you know, that was what, you know, that was one of his, uh, you know, final years at Cincinnati. He gave him a couple years to build things, and this is what he's doing. He's putting that many guys into the NFL. That's more than some of these Power Five teams like Texas and West Virginia even had combined in last year's draft. Darian Varner comes over from Temple, a very good defensive lineman. Uh, that's, you know, about it. They didn't make too many moves in the transfer portal on defense. Jeff Petrowski comes over from Michigan State. He's a veteran defensive end as well. Interesting to see, you know, like you said, uh, long term, they're going to be set up to do damage. And I think, you know, they're, they're going to slightly recruit better than they did at Cincinnati. I think that's one thing that's a given. And I did see the 37th in recruiting uh, in this recent class here. I think that's much better than Paul Chris was able to do for the most part. So, 
you know, what do you what do you think about this Wisconsin defense? Because they didn't really put too many guys in the NFL, I would say, during Chris's tenure. But again, they still had a lot of disruptors. They're really, really good football players. They really showcased their talents on every given Saturday. Um, I'm very interested to see how the scheme's adjusted. How do you think uh, talent development will go, considering Wisconsin's been elite at doing that? And Fickle has showcased the ability to do that as well. It seems like a perfect pairing, because there seems to be a lot of leftover talent in this, uh, you know, uh, northwest region, I guess you could say, that goes unnoticed, and I think Fickle's going to have a field day working with them. I totally agree. I think this is a huge step for Fickle to kind of develop talent here. There was a lot of talent that gets really untapped in Wisconsin, the Dakotas, Minnesota region. So I think these are guys bring in buy into the system, playing at Wisconsin, playing from a lot of crowd in Madison, and develop talent that is really, you know, untapped potential. They have a lot of guys in the past, like you said, you know, they weren't really pumping out a whole lot of draft picks from defense, but these guys were hard-hitting defense, solid, disciplined defense, avoided penalties, and I think that's going to be the same set kind of system that Fickle's going to implement, right? Hard-hitting, disciplined, not a lot of penalties, good on the ball, great defenses that really know how to stuff the run. I think Fickle's going to find a lot of hidden gems, you know, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, that region, upper Michigan region, and kind of pull away from some of the bigger schools potentially as well and kind of grab some low end four stars high end three stars type of talent and turn them into superstars overnight i think this is a real opportunity for fickle to develop and you know create talent out of really not a whole lot in wisconsin i think this is a good opportunity for fickle to show what he's made of he proved that cincinnati he could develop and win with a team that's not that talented on paper i think he has the best opportunity to do it here as wisconsin as well and again the one thing i'm really interested to see on defense is how they transition from the linebacking play because jim leonard's defense great play from the outside linebackers guys in the middle tough guys that really do a lot of the cleanup work that's not going to be the same style of defense here for wisconsin now uh so now we'll get the schedule nick we won't make any predictions for a couple months now we're still going to highlight some of the key games here uh you know they kick off the year september 2nd at home versus buffalo at washington state a team that's losing a lot on defense but has an interesting offense even though they did lose a handful of pass catchers to the portal georgia southern they shot they shocked the world uh you know last year when they went into nebraska and they fired uh scott frost you know georgia southern interesting team that clay helton has there at purdue a lot of changes going on there from the parts and so does all of his offense that's probably going to be a pretty easy game for them then they have a bye week rodgers iowa at illinois and then the game everyone's going to circle at home against ohio state we keep talking about luke fickles gunning for that job in columbus and this is going to be a big time opportunity to make a statement looking at the schedule top to bottom nick i think if things certainly progress faster than we expect this could potentially be a team that's undefeated looking its way into a conference title game i don't know if that's a bit of a reach or not um but uh, you know looking at you know first impression of the schedule the first half of the year uh not very tough one bit so that's why i feel like you know they could really start to put things together in the back half of the year and that's why i think they could certainly cake their walk cakewalk their way to another west championship I think they could easily head into the Ohio State game on the 28th undefeated. You know, the only real game on that schedule that worries me is at Iowa, at Illinois. I think home to Iowa, Rutgers, at Purdue. I think these are all pretty easy wins. It hurts me to say as, as a fan of Rutgers. I think, you know, they're going to have Rutgers numbered this year. At Indiana, that could certainly be a wild one, right? You know, we've seen Indiana in the past get some wild games at Memorial Stadium. Northwestern at home, you know, that should be an easy win. Nebraska at home, another team that has a first-year head coach in developing. I think they're going to be a little bit farther behind. Wisconsin could take them a lot longer to get back into the swing of things there in Nebraska. And then at Minnesota, you know, I think it's a tough place to play in Minnesota in the freezing cold in November, but I think this team is built for that, for being from Wisconsin, so that's not really a knock on them. You know, I see potentially here, you know, nine wins is very achievable. Ten wins even could potentially be achievable as well. The schedule is not that hard. Out-of-conference schedule is pretty light. It's really just the big game hosting Ohio State, right? That's the make or break game to decide where this team's direction goes. I think they're going to cakewalk their way to the West, like you said, and they'll probably get another shot at Ohio State in Indianapolis. You know, potentially. Clear favorites right now in the Big Ten for me. So we should see a, a rematch in Indianapolis, but I just think that there's a little too much of a gap right now to kind of to call potentially winning the Big Ten or beating Ohio State in either of those games. I think they'll go over two against Ohio State next year. I like them to win the West. And, you know, again, it's kind of like more of the same, right? Paul Chris was winning the West frequently, right? He won the West in 2016, 2017, won in 2019, tied for second in 2028, 2018, 2015, and 2021, right? So it's, it seems like it's going to be more of the same, at least for now. And then we can talk about competing for, we can talk about winning the Big Ten in maybe two, three years. I do think October 28th is a perfect draw for this football team. They're good to get Ohio State. Sometimes they'll get them in early September. That's just, you know, that's, that's never good, obviously. Ohio State, they're going to get better as the year goes on, but so will Wisconsin, especially with all these new changes. So I think that's a perfect draw for them. It's going to be for today's episode, guys. As always, Nick, 
appreciate you joining me. Very excited for the long-term future of Wisconsin. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting program that's heading in the right direction under Luke Fickle. Excited to see what they can do as you know more of a scheme change kind of happens here in Madison. This is a fun team to watch and a team to keep your eye on for the next two, three years. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. See you next time.